This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. So much uh, uh, for for being here. We usually save the drinking games at Zocalo for the reception, which follows the uh, gathering. But I see a few people with notes, so I'm going to ask for a volunteer in the audience. This is a broad discussion about uh, diversity and democracy, and and these are three very big thinkers um, who come to us um, from far and distant lands of Washington D.C. and New York, and and furthest of all Irvine, yeah. uh, in in rush hour traffic, but. In each of their works, I've been struck as going over them, they, they, they seem to find their way to, a way to, to write about President Obama in very different ways. So if anyone's out there, make a little mark every time we mention Obama or someone brings the conversation in and we'll count up at the end. Um, we're, we're here to talk about tonight about two things that most of us think of as good, uh, as goods, diversity, democracy, um, and whether and how and well they work together. Um, now, I, I'm... You know, not big on defining terms, and so diversity may be very broad in our conversation. Racial, ethnic, religious, linguistic, ideological, educational, uh, economic. Um, democracy also gets pretty broad. Um, so I'm not gonna, we may depart a bit from the, the Merriam-Webster definition of a system of government by the whole population or all the eligible members of a state, typically through elected representatives. Um, but you know, we, we say and hear a lot of things about th these topics and how they're related, uh, and some seem can seem contradictory. You'll you'll hear sometimes in the same speech, uh, American politicians say that diversity is a great strength of American democracy, um, and then you'll hear people complain that the society is just sort of too complicated. There are too many different kinds of interests for it to be really governed democratically. Um, so let's get into it. My first panel is to someone who I think is actually. Um, it's hard to say this about many people, but it was actually indispensable in American life. Um, if he didn't exist, we might have to invent him. He's Michael Barone to my far right in the yellow tie. He's senior political analyst for the Washington Examiner, resident fellow for the American Enterprise Institute, contributor to the Fox News Channel, uh, and co-author of the Almanac of American Politics. Um, this is an indispensable book. The first edition appeared in, in 1971 when he tells me he was four. Uh, and, the, and the 21st edition um, of 2012 appeared uh, last year. So um, in addition to all his work in the United States, he's traveled to over 54 countries, um, examined democracy and elections there. So I'm going to ask you, we're in Riverside for the first time, so I'm going to ask you a local question and a global question. You know, here's this place. We're near the Mission Inn where... In 1940, uh, two crazy kids, Richard and Tricia Nixon, got married. In 1952, you know, two not so crazy kids, Ronald uh, Reagan and Nancy Reagan, celebrated their honeymoon. But Riverside was a very different place then. 40,000 people, not as diverse and as you know, 300,000 in our in the city today, two million in the county. You know, does do, you know? But yet. As this place has gotten more diverse, you know, you can point to problems of government. You can point to lower levels of political participation by votes. What, what, how, do you, how should we think about Riverside in sort of a, in, you know, a context politically? Okay, we, Riverside is, is uh, emblematic of America or something. <laughs> well, I think it's, you know, if, if you go back to the Riverside of 100 years ago, if you go back to the Riverside that was uh, host to the uh, Nixon wedding and the Reagan uh, honeymoon, um, what, it was originally a settlement mainly by people moving westward to California. It, it's sort of the tail end of the New England Yankee migration that starts in the early 19th century and goes across upstate New York, northern Ohio, southern Michigan, establishes Chicago, marches through Iowa, and makes its way in small numbers to various places in the Los Angeles basin, you know, Pasadena is sort of a New England Yankee outpost and things, and some of the early institutions. And, um, you know, 
it's not the only culture that America had at the time. Uh, we sometimes talk about diversity today, and we're now, Riverside is part of the Inland Empire. It's part of Metro Los Angeles, if you count that as Los Angeles, Orange, San Bernardino, Riverside, and Ventura counties that has nearly 20 million people. You've got population that's perhaps 40% Hispanic, uh, significant percent Asian, the categories that we use now as well as black and white in the census. Um, but, uh, and we've seen declining levels of political participation. Some of us think declining levels of government efficacy. Uh, and, you know, I think as the sociologist Robert Putnam says, it, 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 diversity is in some tension with democracy. There's lower levels of trust in a society that's diverse, less levels of social connectedness or tends to be. Francis Fukuyama says the ideal uh, course of civilization is to get to Denmark. Uh, well, that's kind of a monocultural country, uh, Denmark. Uh, but I would maintain that, you know, we in the United States have been dealing with diversity from the beginning. The New England Yankees weren't the only people here. If you read David Hackett Fisher's Albion Seed about American colonies being settled by people from four different sections of the British Isles bringing different folk ways, everything from religion and politics to sexual behavior, uh, and there were a lot of conflicts between them. That New England Yankee diaspora created the Republican Party that elected to Abraham Lincoln, and they went against the Southern planters that wanted to establish slavery, and we had a civil war, which is a real dysfunctional thing to have in a democracy. So the problems that we're grappling with, the tension between democracy and diversity, is not something that just happened in California in a Riverside 30 years ago. It's something Americans have been dealing with um, I think on the whole with success, but obviously thinking about a civil war with some serious problems uh, for more than 200 years. The, the, uh, I was just talking yesterday with the mayor of this town, who Ron Loveridge, who's not well known in California, was kind of a strange figure. He's managed to stay in office. He's mayor here for something like 30 years. When, and it's, the city it's probably, hasn't gone bankrupt. Mm -hmm. and, and it, has, it hasn't. And um, it's the waters or something. Um, but, um, and also an academic. And he was talking about, you know, how you know, he's been involved in the League of Cities in California and how it's so much harder, you know, California needs to reinvent itself and have a different kind of system, but it's so hard to do that. It's so much harder to, to, to govern now than when he first started because the place is so much bigger and, and, and more diverse. And it, it sort of sounds to me like, the, you know, what Freedom House says about, you know, democracy globally, that, you know, the, the democracy has been significantly more successful in mono-ethnic societies you know, it's, it, it's particularly easier to make transitions, big transitions and big changes. Korea, you know, an easier transition to democracy, not an easy one, but an easier one than Indonesia. Or, um, you know, it was easier for Chile than for Ber Peru. Um, do you buy that at that kind of... Well, I think it's harder uh, for the United States to get to Denmark than for Denmark to get to Denmark. Uh, I think, uh, you know, that's, that's a situation. I think that... If you look back in our history, two ways that we have uh, dealt with these tensions between democracy and diversity are, number one, limited government. I mean, our founders in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights provided uh, in religion, Congress shall make no law regarding an establishment of religion nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That was novel in 1790 in the Western or anywhere in the world regarding an establishment of religion. We had established ch state churches as late as 1833. Congress didn't do anything about them. Massachusetts and Connecticut kept established churches in the Young Republic. We had religious tests for office in New Jersey until 1877. Uh, considering the corruption record there, maybe they should have kept them. But the, uh, <laughs> the uh, and so forth. But basically it said, Congress said, we've got a religiously diverse group of colonies that came from different backgrounds. One was established by Catholics, several by Calvinists, by Church of England people. Congress is just going to be hands off, limited government. We're not going to make decisions for them. The other way is voluntary associations, which Alexis de Tocqueville describes in Democracy in the 1830s, in Democracy in America, that people will gather together by themselves in their own communities and do things and accomplish things. And, you know, Putnam's argument against diversity or criticism of it is that it's, you get fewer of these associations. Uh, I note that Tocqueville in his uh, trip, he nearly half of his journey in America in the 1830s 
was in greater New England, that is, the New England diaspora that I laid out, upstate New York and things. They tend to have more voluntary associations in his time and I think in ours mm -hmm. than many other kinds of Americans. The southern slaveholders, not so many, much in voluntary organizations, and of course slavery wasn't voluntary at all. So there's tensions between them, but those are two ways that we've coped over the years, and I think that to the extent we um, remove limits on government and discourage voluntary associations, that increases the tensions between diversity and democracy. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I want to get um, Richard uh, in, in this uh, point in the conversation. Um, uh, Richard Alva is a, a um, um, is a, 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 a looking at his work. It's 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 um, it's intimidating. It, he he he's um, he's gutsy, um, really gutsy. Um, goes into really difficult and hard questions with a great command and also great and and writes with a great precision about them. Um, he has an interest in race and ethnicity and immigration um, that date to his childhood in the Bronx. Um, we won't say how long ago that was. Um, and uh, <laughs> and he, he, he's currently a distinguished professor of sociology at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Um, and he focuses on race and ethnicity, international migration, author of more books than I can list here, um, the most recent of which is co-authored with Jennifer Hall. Uh, Holdaway, am I saying Holdaway, that? Yeah. Holdaway, and we'll be published next year, The Integration Imperative, The Children of Immigrants in the Schools of Wealthy Societies. Um, you know, Michael mentioned Putnam's argument, you know, the, 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 you know that the more, or he's more diverse in the neighborhood, the less residents trust their neighbors, the turtle effect, all of this stuff. What's wrong with it? Well, I, I think, first of all, it assumes that the divisions between insiders and outsiders are enduring. And I think one of the great stories about diversity in the United States is that those divisions often uh, diminish over time. And so, you know, if we looked at the early 20th century in the United States, this would have been a white Protestant society. At least the mainstream was white Protestant. Um, and then after it's sort of mid-century, it became a Judeo-Christian society. And so, you know, groups that had been really on the outside and perhaps the cause of unease among, among white Protestant insiders suddenly were inside um, themselves. Now, that's a neat trick. It doesn't mean we can do it every time. And obviously, you know, we're facing an enormous challenge today in terms of our ability to integrate the, uh, the children, especially of immigrants coming from Latin America and and the Caribbean, and I think that's really going to determine a lot about our future as a democracy, how well, how well we can do that. You know, if Putnam were right, by the way, we would be in huge trouble um, because one of the most striking trends in American society has been the integration of whites with others in their neighborhoods. So if you look at the, I mean, this is from the 2010 census. If you look at the census tract of the average white now a quarter of the residents are non-white or Hispanic. That's really a dramatic figure, and it's a big change from the recent past. So in fact, there are very few all-white neighborhoods left, and most whites live in fairly diverse neighborhoods where they're encountering neighbors who are, look different from themselves. And so, you know, uh, I guess we would be, have become a very untrusting society if Putnam were correct. I think that um, diversity has brought a lot of benefits to American democracy. And I say that, you know, recognizing that your original statement that there's a kind of, that the two are in tension with one another is, is right. But, um, you know, I think about uh, the cultural leadership that we have in the world. I mean, American cultural products are things that people throughout the world want. And I don't think that would be true if it were not for our ability to have incorporated many new groups and to create a kind of culture that reflects many different influences. I mean, you know, the American cinema was built um, by Jews and by, and by other ethnics, for example, or the, the musical where Jews were so important. All of those kind of brought in new cultural influences into what had been a kind of, not a truly homogeneous society, as Michael's pointed out. Um, we had diversity way, way back when, but still, relatively speaking, 
um, more diversity in, in uh, the mainstream um, than, than we have today. And it's sort of the, you know, it, the genius of American democracy, up till now at least, has been its ability to um, bring new groups into the political mainstream. Um, we, you know, we see that today when we have on one, on one slate an, uh, a person of half African descent and a Catholic running, and on the other slate, a Mormon and a Catholic. This would have been unthinkable 50 years ago or 60 years ago. So it does testify to something expands. Um, and it's not just the sense of membership that expands, I would argue. It's also the range of kind of cultural influences that people bring that then alters the, the political culture. The, um, the, the historian David Hollinger, who is actually at UC Berkeley, so he's on this coast, has written, you know, I think very insightfully about the kind of early interactions in sort of the intellectual world in, in this country um, between Jews and Protestants and remarked that each influenced the other, um, but that what came about from this mutual influence was a kind of a, a public intellectual culture um, that was much less harnessed to a particular um, denomination or a particular kind of form of, of sect, if you will. It became really a kind of a, a, a non-denominational um, public culture. And so I think that kind of influence has been going on really throughout American history, certainly very important in the 20th century, but our big challenge um, which is partly, I think, an economic challenge, is are we, go and, and an educational one, I, having written, sure. just written a book, yeah. um, are, we going to, are we really going to be able to open up the mainstream for the newer groups in a way that we successfully did for the outsiders of older waves of immigration? And I, I don't know the answer. I mean, I think the answer isn't really determined. It has to do with decisions we're going to make as a, as a country, some of them political, obviously. It feels like sometimes there are two narratives in what you just said. One is the narrative of diversity pushing the democracy yes. in a healthy way. Yeah. But there's, there's a counter-narrative there mm -hmm. that we also hear of, of that it's democracy. It's sometimes our democratically elected leaders that have pushed us or, or, you know, our, or the judges they appoint have pushed us in ways well, that's, that, that's that, case, that yes. and that there's this argument you hear um, sometimes from people now democratically elected, sometimes with the tension of nostalgia is that we're, we're somehow a more complex or diverse society now and that it's, it's somehow harder the way our political system works, the way our democracy works to make the kind of big changes that we saw in the past that led to all of these sort of advances that you've just talked about. I mean, I guess sort of the question is, Boy, is, is democracy huge, better is, for our, you know, it's sort of, is, is democracy been better for diversity than diversity for democracy? Well, they've been good for each other in, in, in a variety of ways that we could talk about. But the question that you're asking is, has, have we reached the outer limit of kind of where democracy and diversity can go together? And I think, I mean, my sense, and, and you know, Michael, will probably chide me for what I'm going to say, but my sense is that the, that the nature of our politics has really been changed very dramatically over the last several decades. And I blame um, the uh, enormous amounts of money that have come into our politics that, that I don't think were there 40 or 50 years ago. And you know, it's really, to my mind, tilted the system um, for the benefits uh, of relatively modest and very powerful groups of Americans. And of course, the Citizens United decision and the, you know, all of the new, uh, the dark money, et cetera, the new funding sources that have come up in this election are, you know, an example of that. Now, one might argue, given the way the polls are now uh, showing the presidential race, that their effect has been overstated, but I think it hasn't been overstated when we come to the lower levels of office, which we know, like in congressional seats, et cetera, which we know are very, very important in determining um, the national direction. Thank you, thank you. I wanna bring Jennifer Lee in at this, at this uh, 
point in the conversation. I mean, this really is a, an all-star um, panel here we're, we're very lucky to have. She's a professor of sociology at the University of California, Irvine, uh, author of Civility in the City, co-author of The Diversity Paradox, uh, which I just reread as a tremendous book. Uh, I think I have it here, um, for those interested, uh, written with, uh, with Frank Bean. There's incredible sort of work that's based on interviews in California with, uh, you know, that look at intermarriage, rise of multiracial identification, um, um, and, you know, and, and then some of the things that Richard was talking about, um, um, legal eradication of discrimination, uh, new immigration, um, and integration of immigrants, you know, a lot of things that Californians would pride themselves on, you know, we're forward-thinking people, we've done all these things, and yet, this is a state where it's now conventional wisdom that um, we're ungovernable. We, our democracy doesn't work. Um, um, you know, I mean, are there, are there, are those things connected or not? Okay. Um... That's not the question I thought you would ask me, but <laughs> that's give not us, what we discussed upstairs. Give. Okay, <laughs> so I'll do what I do best, which is I flip the question to what I'd like to talk about, which is in part my book, but also um, bringing together some of the points that both yeah. Michael and Richard made. Um, the first point I wanted to make is the what we argue in the diversity paradox is that. Um, a lot of people think with the election of Barack Obama, we've become a post-racial society, that race has declined in significance, that race no longer matters, that if we can elect someone who is of African descent to the presidency, how can we say that race matters? And so what we find is through data, through intermarriage and multiracial reporting is that while these trends have increased for all Americans, they've increased most sharply for Asians and Latinos and less so for blacks. So what we find is a pattern of black exceptionalism. So while the racial boundaries are fading for Asians and Latinos, they're fading far more slowly for blacks. And we found that through census data, we also found that through in-depth interviews when we asked people um, who would you consider dating? How did your parents react to your dating someone of a particular racial and ethnic background and so forth? And also experiences of being multiracial. So we found that Asian whites and Latino whites had much more flexibility in how they wished to identify than black white multiracials who felt much more constrained because people identified their Afro ancestry. Um, the other thing that we found that was really interesting was that diversity itself had an effect on these trends. So in states and metropolitan areas that were racially and ethnically diverse, they had the highest rates of intermarriage and the highest rates of multiracial reporting. So what we argue is that diversity, the greater the diversity, the greater the likelihood that certain racial and ethnic boundaries are declining. In terms of this discussion, one of the things I wanted to get at was this question that I think people, people assume that increased diversity leads to increased polarization. That if you have a more d diverse society, that it necessarily becomes more polarized. So I actually did some homework on this and I tried to understand are we as Americans more diverse in our opinions than we were 40 years ago when we were much less diverse? And what I found is that we as Americans are more diverse on certain hot button issues like gay rights or abortion, but for m the most part, we have not become more polarized. We have become more polarized on those issues. It seems like we've become more polarized because the group for whom there is increased polarization are political partisans who happen to be the most vocal, who happen to be the people that the media focuses on. And so because they actually have become more polarized on these issues, and these are the issues that often are the focal points of debates, it seems that we are more polarized. But in general, when you look at um, opinion data, actually we're not more polarized than we were 40 years ago when we were a much less diverse society. Interesting. We got our first Obama mention there. And uh, I w wanted to ask something about something in your book. Um, that's my opening. Um, 
that, you know, you talk about black exceptionalism and that, that boundary blurring less, less quickly. Um, is Obama bad for African Americans? I mean, in that sense, yeah. and for the, you know, is it the example of, hey, you know, you can rise to the highest office in the land, undermine sort of arguments sure. for dealing with that black exceptionalism? Sure, I think that um, there was a, I think people were very careful about how they were seeing his election um, to president. And I think there was obviously enormous joy because he wouldn't have been elected 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, so that says something about the United States. Have we become this post-racial society where race no longer matters, that race no longer interferes with your opportunity structure? No, I, that, I, I, one of the things we argue very vehemently in the book is that Obama is the exception and to base the rule based on the exception is a mistake that race continues to matter in a number of ways and most profoundly for African Americans in our society. This is a question for all of you, and, and feel free to have at it and have at what each other said. But there's this book um, that's gotten a lot of attention in recent years, The Big Sort. Um, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We had one of the co-authors, Bill Bishop, write recently for Zocalo, oh. and he talked about you know, two different things going on. Um, that, you know, that, that neighborhoods are more diverse, as, as you talked about. Uh, we're living in, in something approaching harmony with different kinds of people than before. But at the same time, that particular places that, um, you know, within the places, um, and, and we're differing as a country in how we act, think, and vote. There's a lot of more variety, but within the places where we live, there's this increasing conformity in how we act, think, and vote. We've become, uh, one of the things we've used our affluence for, and I think we still have some affluence even though we're here in a foreclosure-heavy county in Riverside County. Yeah. Um, is to move in with the kind of people that tend to share opinions with us. And I think Bill Bishop's book illustrates that very well. I mean, if you go back, um, I think it perhaps exaggerates the trend because he uses as his baseline the 1976 general election. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason that that's a little misleading is that in both cases, the two parties' nominees in both cases happen to come from a historic heartland of that party, but mm -hmm. a historic heartland where opinion was moving against that party. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Carter from the Deep South, mm -hmm. Gerald Ford from the New England settled upper Midwest, uh, which was moving towards a more liberal mm -hmm. stand on cultural issues, which in turn were becoming increasingly more important. So in that election, for example, the Democratic candidate carried the San Francisco Bay Area by a huge margin of 51 to 49 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, the San Francisco Bay Area in the last election was, what, 69 to 29. Uh, and I think that, you know, yeah. there's a certain, certainly among uh, a certain class of professionals, people with high skills can choose where they live. And there's a lot of people who would if they would not move from the San Francisco Bay Area to the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex mm -hmm. for any amount of money. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who would not move from the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex to the San Francisco Bay Area for any amount of money. Because it's just not, they have the sense, pretty accurately, mm -hmm. that it's not their kind of people. Um, I, I, Richard's mm -hmm. answer to his first, the, your, Joe's first question was something I found myself agreeing completely with, and then I almost uh, completely disagree with his answer to the second question. We'll leave that <laughs> one aside. <laughs> well, the first one, the blending in of early 20th century immigrants. You had, you know, southern Italians, you had Serbs, Slovaks, Slovenes, Poles, Jews from the Russian mm -hmm. and Austro-Hungarian empires. All these people who had been second-class citizens in multi-ethnic empires and we assimilate them very well. One reason was that the elites of that day believed in Americanization and not in sort of ethnic separatism. We're going to teach them all in Spanish because otherwise we'd infringe on their cultural, uh, you know, uh, space or something. We, we do have some. History. We had, <laughs> we had. But the other thing that the other thing that I think was a huge culturally unifying event in the United States and one that we. Uh, I think cannot duplicate and would not wish to duplicate was something called World War II. Uh, we had World War II, we had um, 16 million Americans were in the military at one time or another in World War II in a country of 131 million at the beginning of the war. The equivalent today would be a military in which 38 million served. 
That's simply unthinkable to us, to be put in uniform, to be subjected to the same strains, to be brought into contact with the, the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex and the San Francisco Bay Area being brought into conflict and all, uh, into con, uh, you know, in, in common and so forth. That was, and, and what followed for a generation was a generation of uh, conformism, of other directedness, of cultural unity. Um, you, there were some exceptions to it and so forth, and there are some aspects of it that are unappealing. It was not a culture that was tolerant of things like gay people and stuff mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a culture that proved ultimately to be accepting and supportive of civil rights measures. Um, but that society has, it, with continuing affluence, we have sought out our cultural niches, as, as Bill Bishop's book illustrates and perhaps amplifies a little bit. And we've had a politics uh, which has divided people along cultural lines. I mean, if you take the period 95-05, which is a period of very stable voting behavior, uh, the demographic variable most highly correlated with voting behavior is religion or within each sectarian group degree of religiosity. People were voting upon the basis of deep moral beliefs, often religious beliefs, things they had based their whole personal lives and their family lives and great decisions in their lives on. And they were very important to them. And I think one of the problems you have uh, when you uh, increase the size of government is that there, it, can, it can infringe on other people's space in a way that produces conflict. I mean, an example today would be the Department of Health and Human Service rule that uh, all organizations with very small limitation have to, including things like Catholic hospitals, have to provide insurance policies that provides free contraceptives. Advocates of this see this as giving a moral, advancing a moral right of equality for women. Opponents of it see as uh, forcing people to violate their religious consciousness. That's an unhappy conflict to have in our society. Uh, but it's, it's part of the political scene. And whether there were super PACs or Citizens United or not, a lot of people are going to get excited about it. Richard? I want to take it in a somewhat different way. I think that um, what you've raised with the big sort, which I think actually is pointing its finger at something real in our society that contributes to polarization um, isn't so much to do with um, kind of the role of diversity and democracy, but it has more to do with sort of where we are in terms of technology and affluence. And it means, and by that I mean that we now tend to limit ourselves to worlds of discourse that, that are very much worlds that, that we share. I mean, on the internet we have this tremendous choice of places that we can go to, to look up commentary, to look up the latest news. And, you know, I think the research shows that what people do is they choose those outlets that reinforce um, what they already um, believe. And, mm -hmm. you know, what you're suggesting, you know, what the big sort suggests is that um, in residential terms, we're also tending to live in communities where people mm -hmm. are going to be like us in terms of their kind of general political outlook. That doesn't mean they agree with us on every, on every issue, obviously, but, but that they sh we share a lot of premises with, with those who, who are our neighbors, uh, those who sometimes are in our professional worlds. So there's less um, rubbing against one another when people have different views, and there's less chance then for each to appreciate kind of the standpoint of the other. And, uh, you know, I mean, this is a terribly polarized time compared to, let's say, the, 19, the 1950s. Um, and, you know, I think in this respect, you might say it's not so much diversity, it's our, it's our affluence and our technological possibilities that enable us to channel ourselves. But is that a threat to democracy? I mean, I, I remember... Well, it makes such it a, harder to a, agree. But there's such a hubbub about... You know, I, I thought affluence was supposed to be a guarantee of democracy. That famous paper by those two academics whose names I cannot begin to pronounce um, from the 90s is still quoted all the time that no major country with an income above $6,000 mm -hmm. per capita has become a democracy and has then ever reverted to authoritarianism. China's going to test that. Well, we're not, yeah, we're not, I don't think we're going to revert to authoritarianism, but we certainly are experiencing...
uh, difficulties in our ability to effectively make important political decisions. And I mean, you know, the controversies over the national debt, over the tax system are examples of that. And, and I mean, this does come home to diversity because as a country, and we're not alone in this respect, all the Europeans are in the same boat, we face a tremendous challenge that's going to take place during the next 25 years as the workforce shifts from being largely white to more evenly divided between whites and um, minorities. And so, uh, you know, the economic reality is very simple. We're going to depend much more mm -hmm. on um, having its talented minority workers, skilled minority workers, than we've ever had to before, because we're not going to have as many of the majority group um, in the workforce. And yet, when we look at our educational system, it's just strikingly clear how disparate are the outcomes that it produces for the white majority and for Hispanic and uh, African American um, young people. And, and I, I say, I mean, that we share this situation with a number of other countries, uh, Germany, France, Great Britain, um, are all in the same fix and all have, even though they have very different educational systems, it's nevertheless the case that their systems produce these kinds of inequalities at a historical moment when the need um, is great, in fact, to, bring, to sort of bring groups that have been disadvantaged up to the norm the educational norm of the mainstream. And I think but it's- But you're making the perilous assumption there though that the boomers will actually die, right? And they're, well, they, they're too important to ever I'm, let that I'm, happen. Well, right? maybe so, maybe so. <laughs> you mean I they, like there's so many of them that they've arranged it with God. <laughs> no, that I, they, <laughs> I like to say that the good news is that the baby boom generation will die out. The bad news is that I'm gonna die about the same time. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, very good. But very you're good. older than the oldest baby boom, oh. as I am too. Well, um, I checked. They're un, I think they're, <laughs> they're unrepresented on this stage, in fact, uh, uh, but not in our audience. So, um, Jennifer, let me get you in on that, because yeah. he said some things there about polarization, yeah. saying we're in this very polarized time, very different than, 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 than what you were saying right. about this. And I mean, I mean, there's this difference between the polarization of the population and the polarization of the voting population? Is that what you're getting at? Or? Yeah, well, the, there are a couple of things that he said, and, and, and also Michael said, that that actually reminded me of a story that a friend of mine, a colleague, I, I was at the Russell Sage Foundation last year, and, and it brings together this interdisciplinary group of scholars from across the country, and one of the scholars was this woman, Delia Baldessari, mm -hmm. Um, who's an Italian woman, and she said she's studying political participation, pol polarization, and one of the things she said that really struck me was that in all of her time in the United States, she's only met three Republicans. And she said this couldn't be possible, that even, you know, she, yes, she's a sociologist, and sociologists tend to be a left-leaning group, but she lives in New York City, and how is it possible that she's only no, met three is, Republicans? There is one Republican sociologist in the country. No. <laughs> Would you name him or her? I, I, you have to out him. What, will I out them? Yeah, will you <laughs> out him? Right? That was my point, yeah. So yeah. anyway, one of the things she argues is that most Americans will be free to talk to a stranger about the most mundane things like weather or what you had for dinner or your favorite restaurant, but people are only likely to reveal things, important issues like political preferences to people who they think are like them. And so there's this sense when you're talking to someone, you're only likely to get views sh or, or willing to share views with people who you feel like conform with your views. So there's this homophily operating. And so even in with Bill Bishop's book, I mean, one of the things I, I would argue is that people think that everyone is like them, but are they really? And are they really holding back on certain views and not willing to really share them? Um, and, and this idea, w what Richard said about how we selectively get our news. I mean, there are people, there are my friends who read the Wall Street Journal, there are my friends who read the New York Times and the Huffington Post, and, and their views are quite different. And if you think about something like social media, like Facebook, I have friends 
um, we post political arguments on mm -hmm. Facebook. Mm -hmm. But when I thought about that, most of my friends think like me anyway. So <laughs> who are we really, who are we really, we're talking to people like ourselves. We'll get Michael in on this. Well, you have, uh, you know, in a way, we're going back to historic mode. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at politics and journalism in the, most of the 19th century, the early 20th century, uh, it's partisan. People sought out their niche. I can remember right. going to New York City and walking around in the streets uh, circa 1959, 1960, and there were, I think, nine daily newspapers that, you know, that you could pick up, and the different political persuasions and very different ethnic uh, things. We talk about whites today as a homogenous group. New York City in 1959, I would say, in many ways, ethnic differences were still readily recognized of some political significance. You had the balanced ticket. You had to have an Irish, Italian, and a Jew. Uh, you had, uh, you know, uh, things of that nature. It's the period, you know, we, we have this period that starts in that post-war period when we have a supposedly objective national media and a sort of monopoly, ABC, NBC, CBS. Mm -hmm. Everybody watches their newscasts uh, and the, um, you know, and they in turn are basically fed by the New York Times and the Washington Post mm -hmm. and, and so forth. So that's, uh, those days are gone, as those of us who are in print journalism know. Uh, and technology has changed, so we're going back to the historic norm of choosing mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And I guess my argument is that um, limit, limits on government make it easier to avoid very rancorous clashes. Uh, we couldn't avoid the Civil War because there was an issue from the Constitution about the territories being in the control of Congress and should you allow slavery or not there. That was sort of a zero-sum issue. It was raised by the Republican Party, which was formed primarily by New England Yankees and didn't even run candidates in the South. Uh, and the opposition to that led to civil war, people who would not accept the victory of that party. I would say that when you have bills like our current medical care bill that, that raises this issue of um, you know, religious conscience versus moral, you know, personal hegemony. Um, it's an issue that we avoided when we didn't have, uh, when we had a more limited government and when more things were handled on a local basis and by communities that were more homogeneous. Uh, there's a reason that uh, welfare states work better, I would argue, in places like Denmark and Sweden and things because they are or mostly have been culturally homogeneous societies with uh, uh, social norms encouraging hard work and personal responsibility, ethnically homogeneous. Uh, and I've said, you know, people say, well, the Swedish, you know, welfare state works, couldn't it work in America? And I said, well, if we had 310 million Swedes, it would work in America. Mm -hmm. We've got 310 million Americans from a whole bunch of different backgrounds and so forth. Just mm -hmm. one other thing that I'd like to note, apropos of something Jennifer said, and it has some relevance here in Riverside. In 1942, President Roosevelt ordered that there, the, the the, the Japanese Americans in the three West Coast states be taken to uh, con uh, in internment camps. And I'm sure there were some here in Riverside County, which was a citrus growing area, uh, who were taken away for that. If you go back and read the journalism of World War II, you see, you know, the, the, the Japs strike Pearl Harbor. That's a phrase mm -hmm. that, that we would find, you know, strikes us, our ears as discordant. People of Asian descent or nationality were described as monkeys, as subhuman, mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, that attitude is not only repugnant to 100% of Americans today, it's just, as far as I can tell, absent from this country. That's quite a nice transformation and perhaps uh, justifies some of the optimism that Richard suggests. But, 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 you know, and I, and, and I have, a, it's a different, it's the same question I have, but from, you know, to what Jennifer and Michael just said, but, you know, if you're, a, if you're running, if you're a political party or political consultant or political candidate in this incredibly diverse sea of an America, you're trying to, you're trying to win elections, you're trying to build blocks of voters. I mean, isn't, is there a sense that our democracy as it ex exists now, polarized to whatever degree, is a threat? Can, could be a threat to that diversity because it's, you know, 
certain you know, ethnic or racial or religious divisions, maybe they're not strong, those boundaries are weaker, but they're one of the few things they are sort of still easier to pick at to, when you're trying to sort of appeal to people and, 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 and put together a, you know, and to win an election. And that, I don't think hostility to any defined group is uh, a vote winner these days. Uh, <laughs> that I can think of. No, but it's not necessarily hostility. I mean, it's, you can certainly make appeals to particular groups of people who are defined yeah. in racial ethnic terms. I mean, to some extent, well, you could say the presidential election has... Well, President Obama of, gets 95% of African Americans and, voted and, for President Obama uh, uh, last time. Is that a racial uh, sort of thing, or is that just free citizens exercising their judgment about what's best for the country, best mm -hmm. for them, or best for their communities? I say it's the latter. But well, I mean, what do you, what do you, what do you, what, what do you think of that, Jennifer? Well, I, mean, I was it's, actually gonna I, going <laughs> yeah. on to the point of optimism, yeah. um, because I'm optimistic. Um, actually, one of the things I, I found interesting was when I was looking at um, most Asians and Latinos actually do not vote. But what's also what's heartening that's not heartening. But what is heartening is that most of them are not affiliated with a particular political party. So 57% of Asian Americans and 56% of Latinos do not identify with a particular party. I find that heartening because when we talk about the idea of growing diversity leading to more polarization, here's an opportunity for 25 years out when the children of immigrants or now when the children of immigrants, I mean, a lot of the Asians and Latinos who aren't registered to vote are first generation, are immigrants. The children are registering to vote. But what's heartening is that um, there's an opportunity for issues then to take central stage as opposed to parties driving these groups to vote in a particular manner. Yeah, if you, a data point, um in the exit polls, I believe in 2008 and 2010, quote, Latinos and quote, Asians voted closer in percentage terms to quote, whites than to quote, blacks. So I think it's sometimes misleading or oversimplified to talk about voters mm -hmm. of color. Right. Just as in some ways it's simplified about talking about whites. Most of those people voting 69, 29 Democratic in San mm -hmm. Francisco Bay Area are, are white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I should stop reading these Ron Brownstein stories that I see in the LA Times every I've couple weeks about, about how it's all about whether Obama can keep 40% of whites. And, and that's, I've, and that's I've, the Ron and I have had this argument where I've said that, you know, the, that, I, that I think the non-white category is a misleading category. Absolutely. He disagrees. He's a smart guy. Well, I think, I think you're right. I mean, and I think uh, Jennifer's research on, on intermarriage and its consequences show that you know, it's still, in our, I think uh, there's a very deep cultural strain in our society that sees immigrants as more admirable than African Americans. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, Hispanics and, and Asians are benefiting from that. I mean, they're being seen as part of a long historical pattern of immigrant groups coming and working their way into the mainstream. I think that, I mean, I, I'm, I am an optimist in a lot of ways, but I, I think there are challenges today that um, really, uh, you know, are not going to be easy to meet, and our politics makes it more difficult to meet them. And those challenges have to do with really what we have to do as a society to, um, to bring especially Latin Americans mm -hmm. in, into the mainstream. And, and you know, education, um, is uh, something that is getting less and less of its due, public education, less and less of its due, of its due I think, in, in the U.S. And that is a battle that is political, mm -hmm. that also has to do with generational groups and, and with white and non-white splits, I think. And on that note, I actually wanted to just add another important point. Of, I know Richard has also done a lot of research on this about the children of unauthorized migrants, what happens to them? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that our research shows that if um, the children, the second gen the children of unauthorized migrants who are unauthorized themselves, when their parents change their status at some point, their children do better. So mm -hmm. they, if the 
the second generation, when the, if the parents came as unauthorized migrants, but they attained citizenship or naturalized in some way, their, their children actually get two years more of education, just holding everything else constant. And so I think one of the simple solutions about trying to integrate more Latinos through education is making it easier for the children themselves to continue with education. Mm. But, but does it, what is the connection? What's the nature of the connection between intermarriage and, and integration and democracy? My, my father's going to kill me for this. He's in the audience. But you know, when we were growing up, he, his, he's a distinguished journalist, but certainly no scholar of sociology yeah, yeah. or yeah. race. Yeah. And he used to say that you know, this racism would go away after a few generations. You know, when we intermarried well, and we were all a different shade of brown, and so you know we wouldn't have well, a problem. This doesn't, you know, it's it's it, it's interesting to think about this in contrast with some other countries as well, where the differing attitudes on Asians. If we'd had a crowd mm -hmm. of good citizens of Riverside County of this amount of people here in 1942, you would have been cheering the idea of interning the Japanese Americans. Mm -hmm. Most of you would have been. That's mm -hmm. a change. Uh, it's not something that, uh, you know, President Reagan signed an apology bill for Congress and, and reparations for that uh, in the 1980s. Our attitudes have changed. Um, you know, we always have some particularities, I think, and they don't disappear entirely. As I say, in a free country, we're free to seek our, our cultural niche where we're comfortable, and we tend to go to that niche. and and we tend to mm -hmm. seek out the media that we do that and so forth. And you see this in choice of professions. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. some of the academic departments are totally monopartisan, except if you count different kinds of Marxism and things. <laughs> and uh, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, I wish I could say that didn't matter in sociology. <laughs> but unfortunately, looking at the recent presidents of the ASA, I can't. Okay, <laughs> well, I, you know, and, and, and we're going to do that. and. It's interesting, the, the Harvard sociologist Orlando Patterson, who mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. is probably, a, he's from the Caribbean himself. He is, he's yes. Jamaican. Yeah. He makes the point, he makes an interesting point. He says, in America we have, in, we have an elite that is integrated and a people that are segregated. He's sort of talking about everyday yes, life. Yes, yes, he said, yeah. in Mexico and Brazil, they have elites that are, that are segregated and people, in a, in a people mm -hmm. that are integrated which is my observation of sort of daily life in, in those countries. With that, I'm, I'm getting the signal for audience questions and bring this excellent audience into this discussion. My name is uh, Faisal Kazi. I'm an American Muslim. And speaking of President Obama, when I first saw the polls, the three out of 10 people believed that President Obama was a Muslim. I got kind of excited. When I focused on the <laughs> polls and three out of 10 were Republicans or conservatives, I spelled trouble. Um, and then if you looked at certain <laughs> states, specific states like Alabama, where the numbers were much higher, it, it, by that time it, it had become a political issue. And now we have a par one specific party which has a platform, they call it anti-Sharia platform, adopted at RNC uh, very recently. Mm -hmm. You spoke much of ethnic diversity in, mm -hmm. in politics. Mm -hmm. What's, what about the role of religious diversity in politics? Mm -hmm. And is religious diversity bad for uh, democracy? Mm. I think Joe Matthew spoke to this earlier when he said, weren't you the one that said that uh, we used to only have Protestants, and really from certain Protestant mm -hmm. denominations, mm -hmm. on our national tickets. Mm -hmm. And now we don't have a single one of them on either of our two major party national tickets. It's true. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, they, I, I saw someone, Walter Russell Mead, writing that, you know, Obama is the last WASP president. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's the closest <laughs> we're going to get. <laughs> Anyone want to address that question? Richard. I mean, there is, I mean, there is an issue in, in globally. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's data that suggests. Um, you know, on this question of religious diversity, that, that countries that with, um, with, you know, with some religions, um, you know, have, have a harder time um, getting to democracy. Um, there's, you know, that's a... I mean, well, I'd say go back to history, and we, uh, you know, the founders were familiar with this issue. Within less than 100 years, there had been a... By, there had been nearly a religious war in the British Isles, and really mm -hmm. there was in Scotland and mm -hmm. Ireland, and there had been in the 1640s. This was a history they knew. And they also knew that the different colonies had been founded by different religious sects, by Calvinists in New England, but mm -hmm. the Anglicans in Virginia and the Carolinas, Catholics originally in Maryland, though the proprietors left the church. 
uh, got their charter revoked, Quakers in Philadelphia. Uh, and they faced that issue and they wrote something called the First Amendment. And they said, we have freedom of speech. We're not going to ban blasphemous speech, as many countries do. And we have, uh, we're not going to make any law regarding a, an establishment of religion. There will be no national religion. And states can do what they like on that. And they said, we're going to have free exercise of religion. You can do anything you want. That was real unusual. They, in the Constitution, they said there will be no religious test for office. Um, they were acting out of um, not just abstract principle, but experience that they had gained, if not personally, through their knowledge of history, uh, and I think set us on the right path. And uh, sometimes we have strayed from that path in different ways, but I think that that's, that's the right way to go. Well, I've, you know, I, I think you would agree that, you know, our history shows that there's been a tremendous religious conflict, mm -hmm. and certainly in the political sphere, even as, you know, into the 1960s, really, regarding Catholics, and, mm -hmm. um, and we haven't had a Jewish president, and it certainly took a while for Jews to become... We had a Jewish vice president get a plurality of the vote, popular vote. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Some of us think he should have been the vice president, but we won't go there. <laughs> um, but, and, but I, you know, I think it's important to recognize that, um, that religious conflict um, is real and, and, and not so distant um, in our history. Um, when Al Smith ran for president in 1928, I mean, many, mm -hmm. many Protestant ministers, ministers preached from the pulpit, vote against this Catholic, and, mm -hmm. you know, he lost by a huge margin, 60 to 40 percent. Nevertheless, I agree with your fundamental point, which is that there's a kind of institutional structure um, which has tended to keep these conflicts um, within a certain bound, you might say, and ultimately to kind of bring groups um, into, into the yeah. fold. And so, in this sense, although, you know, I recognize the discrimination that many Muslims perceive and, and, and realistically perceive in the larger society, I'm optimistic in the long run that the kind of institutional paradigm that was laid down in the in the First Amendment will ultimately prevail. Mm -hmm. There's just, I, I don't want to keep anyone from their drinks, but this, this is where, <laughs> but there's a, a thing I remember hearing a lot about in the Clinton-Obama battle in 2008 and demographics being destiny, um, that, you know, that, that the argument was that Obama did better, that the African-American candidate did better in places with very little um, racial and ethnic diversity, and then in places with great amounts of it. And that there was a sort of band in the middle where it was tough. I mean, is there, is there an explanation? Is there a reason why? A does that explain why the, the first, you know, Muslim congressman is from, you know, Minneapolis and not, you know, New York City or Detroit? Uh, I think that actually I would apply somewhat different um, uh, frames on that. Uh, if you're looking at, uh, you know, the states that were cited as Obama doing well, like Wisconsin, they're part of Germano-American, uh, Germano-Scandinavian-American. They've always been the most pacifist, isolationist, dovish part of the country. Obama had opposed the Iraq war all along. Hillary Clinton had voted to authorize military force there. Uh, there happened to be very few black people in Wisconsin outside the south side of Milwaukee. Uh, and I think that, germ that it was more that, whereas if yeah. you go to states that band along the Appalachian chain, that's the Scots-Irish. That's the fighting Jacksonians. That the, this is the warlike characters who, uh, you know, uh, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. If you threaten my family or my country, I'll kill you. Uh, and uh, that's, that was Obama. His whole demeanor is not well calculated to win the votes of people right. of that character. Well, it's, it's well a, but that seems to have been true for Al Gore also. So, I know. Well, to some extent. Well, but as but a, Bill and Hillary Clinton did better with yeah, those groups of did. voters. As a, okay. as a Scots-Irish married to a person of German-Norwegian ancestry, that may explain the occasional problems we have at home. Um, <laughs> so, um, in any event, let's end on that note. I, I, please join me in thanking this panel, and, and uh, we'll see you at the reception. Thank you.